You're listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. This episode features a changelog plus plus bonus. What, what, what? That's our membership program where you can directly support our work, make the ads disappear, and get exclusive access to bonus segments like the one at the end of this very episode. Learn all about it at changelog.com slash plus plus. Quick thanks to our partners for helping us bring you awesome pods each and every week. Fassy.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. Okay, let's do this. It's party time, y'all. Hello, hello to all of our JS party animals. I'm Jared, your internet friend, and I'm joined as often, almost always, as often by my friend, Nick Nisi. What's up, Nick? Hoi, hoi. How's it going, Jared? It's going well. Haven't seen you on the pod for a while. I think you've been on the pod and I've been on the pod, but never crossing the wires. So good to be yeah. back together again. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. You need to answer a question for me because did you listen to our latest front end feud? Did you see the question about their favorite programming language? I did. Yes. So you know what happened is that JavaScript was only the second favorite programming language of our listeners. It had 24 people who liked it the most, but 30 people liked TypeScript. So we were wondering how many times you submitted the form. Uh, 30. <laughs> okay. Kidding, Cons- kidding. I didn't submit it at all. Conspiracy confirmed. Thank you. <laughs> Did you? Was that a great moment for you? Was that, uh, was that the best part of your life? Is it when you found out that our listeners like TypeScript more? You know, as I heard that, I was, you know, bumping my fist in the air and thinking of you. Okay. Well, let's talk to somebody else. We have a special guest today. Jim Nielsen is here. Jim is a blogger, web developer. You can fill out your bio, Jim. I know you as a writer because I've been reading your blog for what feels like a very long time, although I went in your back catalog and realized there's a bunch of stuff I haven't read. So probably it's only been about a year, but I feel like I've been reading you for a very long time. I really appreciate your work. On Changelog News, I was telling Nick before you joined, I have a hard time not linking to darn near everything that you put out because <laughs> it's just it's just good. It's insightful. Uh, it's easy to read. So anyways, I'm, I'm done effusing for now. Jim, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, I guess, introduction. That was really nice of you. It's always nice to meet someone who reads my blog. Sometimes it feels like I'm just hitting publish and it goes out into the ether and who knows who's reading it? <laughs> nope, you got you got one reader. You got at least one. Uh, of course, your stuff is often topped uh, Hacker News and other socials. So uh, I know you know there are some other readers, at least on specific posts. But everybody who writes and publishes, even people who podcast and put their shows out into the world, we just sometimes think that no one's on the other end of the stream, you know, until there's feedback or there's some sort of loop back. So here to give you that feedback, please keep writing. You've been publishing online for a very long time. I think 2012 was what I read. Is that right? Your blog? Yeah, my current blog, that's as far back as I go. I think I had a blog before that on, what was that, Blogspot? I could probably dig it up if I tried to find it, but it was you know a bunch of nonsense that I'd probably be embarrassed to archive it on my current blog. I mean, to be honest, probably a lot of the posts from 2012 I'm embarrassed about. I mean, plus from like last year, I'm probably embarrassed about, to be honest. All right. Um, <laughs> well, speaking of nonsense that we're embarrassed about, Nick, you have a blog, don't you? <laughs> yeah. You're describing that, and I'm like, oh man, it sounds like he's talking about mine. <laughs> yeah. See, Nick and I, we blog, but it's like once a year, once every couple of years. And uh, Jim, you blog like four, five, six, seven times a month, don't you? Uh, yeah. I try to shoot for about once a week. Sometimes it's more, sometimes less, depending on the mood I'm in. You know you've made it when you can have a, a section on your blog that's called Hacker News Hits. I couldn't even dream of having that <laughs> right? online. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I I don't know how I feel necessarily about that, but it's there. I don't like to read the comments, uh, to be honest, yeah. a lot of the time, but yeah. That's the nice thing about podcasting is oftentimes, especially if you do interview shows, you can make it onto Hacker News, but the content is more the guest's thing that they're saying and less the thing that I'm saying. Yeah. And so it's like, you don't have to be a quiet, although it, inevitably there's a person who's like, this podcast is the worst, but it's like, that's off topic. Let's talk about the guest. Uh, but when you I'll stop posting that, yeah, thanks Nick. Uh, 30 <laughs> times it said that actually weird. It's one of, you must have a 30 X bot, but when it's all your thoughts, I mean, you're just kind of laying your thoughts bare out there to the world and it hurts a lot more, you know, when people tear them apart, right? Not only tear them apart, but 
you know, I think there's a lot of, oh, that's not what I was trying to say. But now I can see how maybe you understood that. Or sometimes it's like, I still don't know and understand how you thought that. Um, yeah. That just made me think, like, like I wonder if uh, one thing that, you know, you have like search engine optimization uh, and that's like something that you, you think about, like, you know, trying to get your word out in the future, in the very, very near future, are you going to have like some kind of like comprehension optimization to where like, okay, this is how, you know, open AI summarizes this document. Is it hitting all of the right points? Do I need to like feed it with something else to, to make it, mm. you know, as we lose our attention spans and just ask open AI to summarize everything for us. Not that I did that or anything. Right. Not on Jim's blog. No way. Every, read every <laughs> word. You know, I don't know. Uh, I've read some summaries lately and I, I feel like maybe I'm just, I'm on like the downward trend. You know, there's the hype cycle and I'm like over the hill and now I'm like getting into the trough of disillusionment with all of the generative AIs. It's just like, and I've also read, I don't know if it's true or not, that the results are getting worse. And so yes. for me, I'm just getting less and less value from them and just more and more kind of grumpy when I want more value, you know, to where I'm like, ah, AIs are bad. Plus you've moved on to superconductors. So that's true. A topic of which I know nothing about. So <laughs> let's talk about that for a while. It's the internet. Oh right? man, I already feel behind. What is this? Superconductors? <laughs> is this the new thing? Yes. It's the thing of the moment is the LK99 superconductor at room temperature or maybe not. That's the question. But uh, that's as much as I know. Nick, you're head nodding. You want to fill us in the rest of the way or should we move on? Yeah, you can synthesize it with like $24 worth of materials. Uh, that's that's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe not. Yeah, yes. it's unproven. It's an ongoing debate and people are trying to reproduce. And one person maybe did, but maybe they didn't. And then somebody else also might have, but we're not sure. And this is going to change the world, but maybe it won't. So that's kind of the status of <laughs> the internet this week. Sounds like AI. Sounds like NFT. Sounds like... Bitcoin. That's why I said like... it. It's the thing of the moment. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like TypeScript. Oh, oh, oh Nick. Whoa. Oh, my God. Sorry, did I, I like this guy. I like him more and more. <laughs> oh, we could talk TypeScript, but we try not to around these parts. We are not a TS party not despite true. Nick's not true. best efforts. Let's talk about some of your writings, Jim. The one that really triggered me and th made me change the way I think or kind of put words around something that I've also felt uh, was your language level toll roads post where you're noticing something about the new Dino KV storage feature. Not hating on Dino specifically. You're a fan of Dino. I'm also uh, very interested in what they're doing. Use it a little bit and respect the team quite a bit. But there's this like open source meets startup service provider hosting platform thing that's going on. And it's relatively new. And Dino is one of these things where it's like, you know, open source runtime, et cetera, et cetera. But at a certain point, there's a business behind it and they have pretty clear lines on Dino Deploy. That's their business. And uh, these things aren't usually all that confusing. But now we have this new feature, the, the key value storage, which is built in to Dino, like you, you to create your key value storage, you open Dino.OpenKV is like the function that you call. It's right there as part of Dino. And it's cool. It's interesting. In fact, we had Luca from the Dino team lined up to come on the show and talk about the way it works and everything. And still happy to do that. I think the timing hasn't worked out quite yet, but it's interesting because it has this SQLite database when you run it on your machine, but then you can like swap that out in production seamlessly with their backend which is like a distributed database, you know, all around the world. And it sounds like a really neat thing. But what you noticed and why you called a language level toll road is the way they're going about building this is just kind of new and different and kind of, what do you call it, icky? Feels, it feels strange. It feels a bit strange. That's what you said. And this post is not necessarily like you're not ranting and raving and trying to call them out. You're actually trying to like think out loud. And it seems like it struck a nerve with a handful of people like myself who's like, you know what, that is a bit strange. And I've noticed it amongst kind of the more recent companies that run open source projects where it's like, it's not really built on top. It's kind of built right in. You want to expand on what I've said so far? Yeah, I think, well, to be clear, just to make sure um, Luca still wants to come on the show after I start talking. <laughs> no harm, no foul. Yeah, I love Dino. And when I saw this, I was super interested to see what they were making because I'm really interested in, in everything they've done thus far. And this one just kind of threw me for a loop in the beginning. 
because I was like, wait, well, how, I couldn't actually sort of grok how, how it worked. And so I was trying to understand how it worked. And it reminded me of, it kind of goes back a little bit further than this because it kind of reminded me of Next's image component where it's like, don't write regular HTML. Don't write an image tag, like use this component. And if you don't use it, then the linter starts yelling at you. And I don't like that because I'm like, I just want to write HTML. And now the linter's yelling at me. Why is this invalid? And it's because it wants me to use this image component. So then I'm trying to think, well, how do I use their image component, but not actually host host it on Vercel? Like, what if I'm doing something else? How does that work? And so I was diving into how that component works. And I still don't understand it. It sounds like you can write sort of a thing where you use the image component, but it still just outputs a regular HTML image tag. And it doesn't actually like, you know, take your images and host them somewhere and give you all the extra stuff that it gives you. But it was just a little bit of a disconnect for me because they're like these abstractions on top of open languages like HTML, right? And Dino sort of felt like it took that even a step further where it was like, how is this working? I don't understand how it's working. And to your point, in development, it's like a SQLite database. And then in production, it, it runs on top of their thing, which is interesting that it's at the language level because I almost would have expected it to be like a separate package that you import. And then, you know, do something yeah, with or like the adapter pattern, right? Yeah. Where you could just like have an adapter called SQLite adapter and have an adapter called Dino adapter or whatever. Right. Yeah. That was, that's what I would expect, which is pluggable. Right. And that's sort of how your mental model is for how these things work. Right. Yeah. There's like the open Dino thing. And then there's these things on top that you can use. And I was trying to think of in the post I outlined, like, can you imagine Node doing something like this? What if you wanted to use, you know, FS file system and Node was like, go ahead and use it. And by the way, if you host it on Node's hosting platform, for whatever reason, I don't know, we have some special hardware and it'll be faster than it will be otherwise on other people's. It felt like, man, that would feel so weird if that was a thing just right in Node. And not only that, but then you start getting into these questions about like Node having sort of a leg up on everything because they actually own the the runtime. And so they can do things that other people can't who are building on top of Node. And I was trying to think of like parallels to that. Even it reminds me of the whole like Amazon basics fiasco where, you know, people were building things and then Amazon was like, oh, that's really popular. We'll make one that's just a ripoff of that. And then everyone was buying that instead. Yeah. yeah. Call it Amazon basics, promote it number one and make it a little bit cheaper. And I don't know, I just I was thinking out loud about how strange it felt and I guess I'm wondering if that is going to become a pattern for, you know, new technology startups and a way to monetize the thing that they're doing and allow them to continue to work on it, which I understand, you know, you got to make money so you can continue to work on these things. But also, where is that line between becoming such a great abstraction that everyone wants to use it and becomes open, but you got funded to build it? So you got to try and make money on it some way. And right. I, I, language level toll road, I just started thinking of toll roads and that was like the best sort of title I could come up with. But I think it makes sense. And I like not all of this is bad. Like it does feel strange, but I'm kind of like, you know, at a certain level, it's kind of nice to just be like, well, I got this built in KV thing and it just why wouldn't I use Dino, of course, because I'm using Dino. So like Dino run or Dino deploy. It, it seems like a, a, like, I don't know, Nick, what do you think? It, it feels kind of weird, but also I'm kind of like, well, it's strategically kind of smart and it's slick. And I don't know, they're putting a lot of open source in the world. So like, I'm kind of on the fence about it, but it's a newer thing. Nick, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think like I, I'm all for them trying new things to try and like sustain themselves and get funding and, and, you know, make money on, on this open source stuff because it provides a lot of value the thing that just feels icky to me is it being on the Dino global itself rather than being something that you pull in, you know, and you could basically have the same exact thing and you could even technically have the same like level of influence, you know, just pushing PRs through that directly support what you're trying to do with this package, but it's just right. a third party package. And that feels like the better way to go rather than this, because what if I wanted to make my own Dino key value store? I'm, I would never, I'm never going to be the built-in one now, so 
Well, it's, yeah, like, it's JavaScript, man. Just monkey patch it or something. Can't you just <laughs> replace that object with your object? I don't know. But, you know, I'm with this you. This isn't Ruby. I think it's also, for me, you know, you think of someone who has not used Dino before. Mm-hmm. And they come in and they're looking at the code base. And it's not immediately apparent what that is when you're looking at the code. It's like, oh, that, cool. And you don't you don't understand necessarily by just looking at it. Oh, that's a like proprietary thing that I only get if I'm using the Dino runtime when I deploy this. And otherwise, it's working this way. It just feels like a. It, that's also where it kind of throws me off a little bit. I think you certain you have these certain expectations when you're looking at code. This is how it's going to work. When you see that it's a separate package that's installed, you're like, okay, I'm bringing in this other separate thing that has its own sort of way of working, and that kind of throws me off too a little bit. Yeah, it just kind of parallels a lot of how I feel about Next right now. <laughs> to be honest, I know you call that out in the blog post, but like. It's like if you choose Next, but you don't want to choose Vercel, it feels like a really weird choice. And I don't really like that because at the same time, Next feels like the the right choice if you think that that's the future of React, like with server components and all of that. Uh, it's a weird like middle ground to be in right now. Right. Like the React team is like, hey, Next 11 supports this new thing. And so like they're kind of saying you should use Next if you want. RSC, right? Mm-hmm. At least that's what they were saying last time we talked to them. Maybe they've changed their tune. And then Vercel's saying, well, Next works best on Vercel. And so I was like, now I feel like we're just being all funneled like cattle into like this one holding pen. <laughs> and that doesn't feel great. So I, that, I just tend to try to stay out of that entire thing. And, and I think where it is, I mean, frameworks and runtimes, right? Language level things is where it's like the most concerning, which is probably why, Jim, why your radar went off. Because it's like, you know, what if Python did this? Like just Python now all of a sudden had like this company attached to it. And it was like, hey, if you use Python, like one of the world's most popular programming languages. And we have a new key value storage that's like attached to a corporate entity. I feel like everyone would revolt and like the Pythonistas wouldn't allow it. But I think if Dino were Node, I think you wouldn't be the only one writing about this. I think there'd be a lot more kerfuffle, don't you? I mean, I think so. I've, I, that's why I tried to include the Node example. Yeah. Because for me, just writing it was like, oh, this feels like there would be instantaneous outcry if someone saw something like that in Node. But I guess because it's Dino, I don't know, people don't notice as much. But to your points earlier, it does seem like something that you're starting to see elsewhere. And I get the convenience of it. It's like, hey, I, I don't want to have to deal with this. Like, I'll just fork out. <laughs> what I worry about is like, I'll just pull out my credit card and all of a sudden I'm chart, you know, five bucks a month to use <laughs> language features everywhere just for convenience. Yeah. And all of a sudden I'm spending tons of money. But I, I also understand the convenience of it. It's really nice. It's nice to have an option that has a built-in key value store. I mean, so useful and one that just persists on its own. I, I haven't looked at the API, but I'm assuming it's pretty straightforward to put data in, get data out. And the fact that they'll actually then take that and assuming that it works well, they'll replicate that around. And now I have like distributed KV store built in. I mean, like that makes me as a developer very productive. And I really like that. And I want that. But you also want competition on your hosting providers. You want them to compete on the basis of the quality of their service and their support. And like, that's the things that they should be, they should be competing on, not on, well, we're the ones that run the runtime. And so, you know, we're the option that you get, because what happens is everything's happy, honky dory and I'm using it. I'm paying five bucks a month. Sounds reasonable. They're providing a lot of value, five bucks a month. Well, then it becomes 10 bucks a month and it becomes 15. And you're looking around like, where's a $5 option? Eh, there aren't any, cause there's no, access. So, but also at that point, you also start to feel, I'm trying to remember who I heard this from. I think it was Dave Rupert who talked about this idea of, you know, those spikes that you drive over that they're like, don't drive backwards. Like once you go over them, right? those claws have you, you, you start to sort of face that where even if there is great competition, you're like, oh, but to refactor that code to now fit this other, you know, competition, I'd have to pull out so much and it feels like your tires getting stuck in those <laughs> in those claws. This is a trend though, maybe not at the language level, but if we look at warp is a new terminal that requires an account, Zed is a new editor which uh, to his to Nathan Sobo's credit doesn't require an account right away, but if you want to use any 
features like sync and whatnot, it's going to require an account. I just installed the Arc browser. I They want you to create an account right there. So like, and okay, Arc isn't open source. Zed, I think parts of it are. Uh, these things are like different, but it's this software product that is like free and sometimes open source attached to this entity that's like in the background, but also coming in through the side door all the time. I don't know. It's definitely, that's definitely a trend. And we see it with Dino, although again, different things. You got product versus a, a language. It really does seem like we're reaching this level of abstraction where like these pieces that we really want that are starting to become more table stakes are not, they're not sustainable without your credit card attached to them in some way, you know, and, and then you, you really run into vendor lock-in with, you know, if you think about like serverless functions, right, you could do them, you know, the Lambda way, you could do them the CloudFront way, whatever, uh, they're different runtimes and you have to, you, you're locked into that and it, to go refactor that is kind of a major change. And this is kind of the same thing. I think really the main thing that I have is like, is, is just it being like on Dino. You know, and I know that they have like a, one of the things that they tout is the the standard library. Like that's a big perk over node. Right. And this feels saying an abuse of that seems like an overkill, like the wrong terminology, but along those lines. Yeah. I think that's a really good, I mean, I'm still like just trying to think about all this. Uh, I don't have clear thoughts on it all, but to your point about pulling out a credit card, it feels like currently, or at least in the past, there was kind of a clearly defined point at, I'm going to pull out my credit card, and now I get this separate thing that plugs in. And now it's like, you're looking at code, and each line of code could be a point at where you're pulling out your credit right. card. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, is this a line of code where I have to pull out my credit card? I don't know. Or maybe, the, and you're, to your point about it being on the global, it's on the global, so I think it's free, but maybe it's not. That's the part that just feels so weird to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly unattractive, to say the least. All right, well, we've covered that one, I think, pretty well, of course. All the links to Jim's blog posts uh, will be in the show notes for people that want to read everything he has to say about a topic. Let's talk about quitting. This was a favorite of mine that I think about a lot because I don't want to be a quitter, you know, and sometimes I think that's wrong. And then other times I'm like, not nah, done with this. And th- that feels really right. But other times when you're done with something, it's because you fail, like quitting's attached to failing. Anyways, you have this post from back in January, the art of knowing when to quit. And, uh, you know, hats off for the semisonic reference. Of course, closing time is a favorite of ours around here at JS Party, because that's what you play at the end of uh, most good parties, at least back in the 90s, that's what you played. I don't know what the kids play. But it's this idea of like, we feel like with creativity, creative things like quitting's failure. And so like the idea is I just got to keep doing it forever. And sometimes that's bad, like, especially with like the TV series lost, you know, like they should have quit after uh, season three, even without any answers because their answers were so bad. Come season six, uh, you reference Seinfeld, of course, Jerry Seinfeld, one of the best quitters of all time where he quit at the top and left everybody wanting more. And I feel like that's the way to go out, but that's also the hardest time to do it. So the question with the art of knowing when to quit is really two questions. The first one is when do you quit? And then how do you quit? Both are difficult. What are your guys' thoughts on the win? Let's start with the win. When do you, when can you know when to quit? I mean, if you're like the, if you're like the Simpsons, you would have quit after season nine, probably. They're on like right. season 33, but I haven't watched it. I hear that they're going through a renaissance and it's getting really good again. Really? So is it, did they survive the dip and now they're back up? Maybe. Or Futurama. Futurama has quit four times and now they're back again. The second time Futurama came back was really good though. So yeah, I haven't, I'm not, I'm not current, but I remember when it quit and then when it came back and I'm like, oh, I'm really glad this one came back. But those are, those also have external factors. Like when you get like TV shows, a lot of times you get canceled. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, it's not up to you. You, I'm sure the creators of Firefly wanted to keep going, but they were canceled after like 11 episodes. Curse your sudden, but inevitable betrayal. Ah, ah, ah. And then the cult took over and, you know, demanded more and they eventually made a movie, but I'm sure the cast, the crew, the writers, probably the director, they wanted to keep going, but you know, the studio 
stopped it or whatever. There's just lots of different, there's business reasons, right? There's political reasons, there's et cetera. But if we just keep it in the small and talk about ourselves, because we can control that. When do you know when to quit, Jim? Something. It's a really great question. I, one of the things that is really interesting to me about this idea of quitting is I, I've heard a lot of comedians talk about this idea. You know, you're on stage and you're kind of getting this, there's always kind of this feedback that you're getting as a comic about how the audience is responding, what you're hearing in the audience. Is there silence? Is there groaning? Is there continual laughter? Like, and if you do that a lot, like every single night, I'm sure you get a really good sense for how the crowd is feeling and you probably have a better pulse on when should I quit? Because you've done it a lot. You've gone too long. You've ruined it. Sometimes you've probably gone too short. You're like, I probably could have stayed out there a little bit longer, right? So you're doing it a lot. Right. And that was one of the things that interested me when I saw Jerry's Jerry Seinfeld's quote about it. Because he said something like, if I leave right now, the audience will have this feeling and they'll never have to say, that was good, but and then it kind of started to run out of gas. So he obviously had this, this sense for when that timing was right. And I don't know if we have a lot of, maybe you guys could think of some examples, but a lot of really good examples of that in software of when you think, yeah, those guys, you know, they quit right at the perfect time and, and they ended. And I think at the end of the post, I talk about this too, because there was another piece that talked about how software should be entitled to a life cycle. There's a beginning, a middle, an end. Projects shouldn't be required to sort of live on forever. That's just life, you know? Circle of life. You live, you die. And sometimes it feels like there is an expectation that software should, you know, live on forever. And how do you know when to quit? And he, the author of this, let's see, it was John McBride. He talked about how there was a framework that they just decommissioned it because it was sort of rotting from the inside out. And they said, rather than just let it live on in this sort of broken state, we're just going to kill it and take it off of like all of these places where you can install it and stop letting it be a, a broken chain in the supply chain of, I can't remember the specifics of that article, but anyway, I can't think of a lot of examples where people quit software at a really great time. It Most of the time it feels like they were forced out and we were just talking about <laughs> the Apollo earlier. I mean, that Christian's definitely leaving at a point where people are left wanting more and they're probably going to be left with a really great taste in their mouth for, oh, yeah, I always loved that. Yeah, I miss it so much. It never right. got to this point of being ruined. Yeah. So interesting note. So on that post by John McBride, he's talking about Gorilla. And Gorilla is a web framework in the Go ecosystem. And there's a sequel to this story because they did exactly as you described, but very recently, in fact, July 17th, 2023, which is just a few weeks ago, it's back, baby. Gorilla is back. It is? New set of core maintainers. So it's not like the same people that did it picked it back up again, but somebody else picked it up and is resurrecting it like Phoenix from the ashes. So, you know, sometimes you quit and then sometimes, and that's the beauty of open source is like, well, if it if if it's worth something, somebody else will come along and maintain because it's going to be worth it to them to do so. And we've seen that countless times happen. There's also times when it doesn't happen. And then it's like, well, this project is finished. I think with with software, it's so interesting because we assume if it's not actively being worked on and maintained that it's dead, like, and that's de facto bad, right? Like, is this project dead? You know, GitHub even has a pulse, which is kind of buried now in their insights, but it's like the pulse of the project to see how healthy it is and stuff. And it's like, if it hasn't had active responses on the issues and blah, 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 it's kind of like, you know, no heartbeat to this project and therefore dead. But some software I think is done. And I think the smaller the scope of what you're working on, which is kind of a, maybe an advertisement for the Unix philosophy of software, right? Is like, if your project is small and does one thing and does it well, I think it could totally be finished. Like, is people are people actively maintaining and adding features to LS? I mean, LS is a utility on every Unix-based system in the world. And is it changing? 
I'm sure if there's like a critical bug, somebody is going to go in there and fix that in LS and roll it out to the world. But pretty much like that's a core util. It's pretty baked. And maybe if you go man LS, you can find at the very bottom of the maintainers. But who knows? Those people could be retired or dead by now. I don't know. I'm not sure how it works. I'm, I'm seriously asking. But that's like an example of something that that project should be finished pretty much. And if you want to do a fancier stuff, write a new LS. I'm sure they're out there as well that does it differently. But we just have this sense that if it's not currently making progress, then it's like it died on the vine, like a failure. I think we just need to get over that sort of. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll give a shout out to uh, another one of my favorite. So my blog is built on top of Metalsmith. I don't know if you know Metalsmith. I love Metalsmith. I mean, this is my take on it. It has a really interesting sort of philosophy on how to do static site generation. And the core idea is really sound. And the library was built on top of this core idea. And it's been on version 2 dot whatever for years since, I don't know, I feel like it's maybe 2016 or something like that. Like I've never had to update Metalsmith to a major version on my blog, which I've been, you know, running for years and years. And it's so nice that I don't have to come in, update my dependencies, find out maybe like there are breaking changes. Maybe those affect me. Maybe they don't. Who knows? And I love that they have kind of just let it be at that core idea. They haven't been like, hey, you know what? It might have been better to do it this way, and we're going to change it to be this idea in three, and then four is going to change to be this, and five that. And I almost feel like if they had another take on it, I mean, I don't know the dynamics behind why why it seems to be maintained so sparsely, but they probably would just create a new library and call it something else and not sort of break people downstream of this thing that's been running for years and years the way it is. And it's kind of like the LS idea of if you were going to do something different than LS, you'd probably just call it something different and do something different entirely. And maybe that is for us making software something to consider when you think about quitting. You quit and let it be where it's at. And if you want to do something different, you just call it something different. Food for thought, for sure. And then the how is also interesting because I think how you go about quitting something kind of informs whether or not it is a failure or a success because like the slow fade into obscurity with the guilt and the, um, and then maybe promises of bringing it back again, you know, that, that blog post that says I'm back, you know, or the way that every podcast fades out is with one last show, you know, that says we're back and it rededicates itself to publishing more regularly. Like, I feel like that's a way to kind of fail out but if you go out with a bang and you're like, hey, last show, let's freaking have a party and like set your expectations for whatever it is, last blog post, you know, so long and thanks for all the fish or whatever the silly sayings are, that's different. Like that's, that's framing it. But you have to, I think before you can do something like that, you have to actually make a decision to stop. And that can feel like failure unless you have some sort of meeting of goals or thresholds. I don't know, Nick. How do you feel whenever you wrote that that last blog post? <laughs> I'm not talking about you in particular. I'm just trying to pull you back into the conversation. Yeah. No, it's uh... <laughs> how I rewrote my blogging engine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Once every two years, how I rewrote my blogging engine. Yep. I switched from Metal Smith to Eleven D. Yep. <laughs> and now I'm going to blog more often. Yeah. Exactly. And then I never do. <laughs> Jim Nielsen said to write once a week, so I'm going to do that. The, the example I was trying to think of, and I don't know if this is actually the case or not, but it seems plausible. I've been really getting into a language called Lua uh, lately because it's how I tend to configure everything, starting with NeoVim and now my terminal and all these other things. But I've been really diving into it and like kind of looking at the, the reasons why NeoVim specifically switched to that over VimScript is A, it's a better language. Anything is a better language than VimScript. And B, it's considered a complete language. So once you learn it, like you know everything. And it's embeddable. It's tiny and can be embedded in literally everything, which is why it's in games and it's in Vim, NeoVim, and it's in, you know, everything. I was trying to think if that was an example of it. I know that I just looked it up on Wikipedia and they just had a release in May. So I don't know what, how complete it is, but 
So Jose Valim of Elixir did the same thing. He, he announced that Elixir was API complete at, at some point years ago. And that doesn't mean they're not working on it. They're still going to do performance. They're still going to have tooling stuff. There's like a lot of things you can do that makes the language better or using the language better, but it's not adding to the language itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that is kind of a success. It's like, wow, because I'm with you, Jim. There's like a fatigue to like constant change of your tools. Uh, kind of an upgrade fatigue where it's like, oh, I got to go through, I'm having this with Phoenix right now, the the framework that we use for our our website where it's like they changed to verified routes, which is a cool new way of doing your routes. And it's like, you should upgrade, you know, and there's like deprecation warnings. So like this new style of routes. And, and for me, it's shorter. So I like the end result in my code than the way that I currently do it. Like it, it literally reduces characters. But there's no actual value beyond that of the, of the switch besides like making the deprecation warnings go away. And I'm just like, I have so many routes like just scattered throughout all my templates, right? Like you're just like linking the stuff like all over the place, hundreds, hundreds, maybe thousands. And I'm like, I got to go through and update all these, even the, even the best regular expressions and the, the tools and everything and the, the type system I don't have, like none of these things will make this faster, you know? And that's, annoying you'd be a type system would no because this is like all strings at the end of the day this is uh this is a land you don't know about nick it's a <laughs> land filled with milk and honey called elixir anyways i i mean lua i i think that's kind of a win is like being like now nah, we're done you know we're not going to throw in a key value store on the top level <laughs> of the language here we're done i hope not i i mean i think <laughs> I, th I think that's actually a really good i mean you said we're done and I, I wrote the post as the art of knowing when to quit. And I was thinking about that word quit because I think there's a lot of baggage connotation. Yes. Yeah, that people think of when they think of quitting. Whereas if you say the art of knowing when to be done or the art of knowing when to stop. Yeah. That, like that's very different in people's minds when you hear that. And, you know, being done with something is a good thing. Versus yeah. like quitting something, right? I think that was my commentary when I linked to you in Changelog News. I was like, I think if you think about it as finishing, it's not as bad as if you think about it as quitting. Because it's the same exact action, but it's just a, the intent is completely different. And I think that that does help you. Just be like, well, this is done now. Which can still be hard. Like if you have a successful thing, you know, like JS Party, it's a successful podcast by many measures. But like if we were to say we were done... We've been doing it how many years, Nick? I mean, five years? Over five, yeah. Yeah. Like, that would be hard. It'd be a lot better than fading out into obscurity and, like, quitting, like, quiet quitting, which is a new thing. <laughs> but it would be hard to sit, even to, to finish, right? To be like, nah, we're not going to produce any more episodes. Like, that would be hard, but it'd be a lot better way of doing it than quitting. So, yeah, I agree, Jim. I think there's baggage around the term, and it has a lot of connotations that makes it harder to do. So I think intent... And then timing, you know, uh, always leave them one and more. I think that's, I think that's what Jerry Seinfeld did. And I think if you can do that, then you're, you're ahead of the game, but it's probably still hard. Should we quit this topic? <laughs> I can't stop. Feels like a good stop. time. Yeah. Leave them one more. Listener, if you wanted more on this topic, too bad. <laughs> I'm trying to leave you wanting more. That's exactly as we intended. Come back for the next episode. That's right. Let's talk about the stratification of social networking. This is not your title. I subtitled this section of our conversation this. I think it's on point. Uh, when did you write this one? It was January. You were on fire in January, Jim. In January, you wrote, subscribe wherever you get your content, which is keying off of this statement that podcasters often say, and I've said it many times is subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We say it a little bit differently. We have a website we want you to go to. I think that's even just a little bit better. It's like, go to our website. You'll find all the ways to subscribe there. Um, but I also say the other thing. But this is kind of a cool thing about podcasts that make them different than other social things. Is their platform independent? And this is something you would love to see more of. You want to launch off from there? I think what first struck me about this is, you know, when you listen to a podcast, a lot of times you hear advertisements that they do their pitch. And then a lot of times I'll hear, you know, advertisements for podcasts. So they'll, they'll pitch the podcast and then they'll say, you know, find us wherever you get your podcasts. 
And I thought it was so interesting that here you have a paid advertisement that's pointing you to nowhere in particular, at least to not any corporate entity. It's pointing you to a piece of content, but not where to get that content. It's not, hey, stream it now on Netflix or follow this thing on Facebook or... And this idea of being able to distribute your content in a way that is not tied to any particular entity is really interesting. And I think about it even more with, I think I ended the post talking about, like, I'm super big. I, one of the things I love about Blue Sky, I don't use it at all, but I got it on just so I could get my username at jimnielsen.com, jim-nielsen.com, that is. Got to get that hyphen in there, otherwise people might think you're the, the senator or whoever he is, the congressman. You know, side story, there's this guy, this other Jim Nielsen in the world who owns the one without a hyphen. And I emailed him years ago. And each year on his renewal day, I emailed him like, hey, you want to give that up? And he just, and he doesn't even have anything there. I don't know, maybe he does now, but he never wanted to give it up. And I just, now I got to have that hyphen. And I kind of despise it. I hate hyphens in domain names. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, that's a ideal. tangent. But it would be interesting to live in a world where you hear people, you know, can you imagine hearing some popular influencer like, follow me wherever you follow people online <laughs> or find and subscribe wherever you get your content and it being much less tied to an entity and more to, I really like this idea of like people being able to own domains, you know, follow me at Jim Nielsen.com and you just Jim hyphen Nielsen, Jim hyphen Nielsen.com. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you could just take that domain and put it into whatever type of content, music, video, text, and it would, you know, have the magic to know what feed to subscribe to. And all of a sudden you got it. And there's no corporate entity sort of between you and that. And it feels like in some ways, I mean, podcasts are interesting because they are sort of going that way. Like you have businesses who are putting real money into supporting this model that gives users all the power to browse, follow, access podcasts. I mean, excluding Spotify and, you know, all, all of that, right? <laughs> I was going to say at the same time, there's entities that are trying to go the opposite. Right. And thankfully, Spotify is failing to a large mm-hmm. extent. Like they do have an audience there that we ha- that we appreciate access to. I mean, we're there. Our our theory, our philosophy, much like uh, always leaving wanting more, is be where the people are. Like, don't try to make the people come to you. Just go ahead and be where they are. And so that can be annoying as a creator because, like, I don't want to have a Threads and a Macedon and an X. <laughs> yes, I said X. Account, <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> embrace or or die. You know, I'm not sure if you were referring to were you referring to the old Twitter there or just hypothetical new X company that might exist. <laughs> yeah, well, insert yeah dollar sign X. Just insert your new thing here. But that's where the, I mean. But there's people in all of these places. I mean, uh, we even post on LinkedIn because there's people there that and Jim. I know you're a big fan of LinkedIn. Go to jim com slash LinkedIn. And the reason why I think this is more interesting now today than it even was when you wrote it you know, eight months ago is because when you wrote that, of course, this is the way podcasts work, and we see all of the, the value of that setup. And in fact, when we had Corey Doctorow on the show, he talked about how podcasting is very resilient to identification unlike every other platform or every other medium, which has been corporatized. But at the end of that, you say like, what if you say, follow me wherever you follow people or, you know, get subscribe wherever you get your content. I was like, I can see people move into that format for everything now. Right. Because like, where, where do you go? Everything feels more unstable than it was even in January. Cause of course Musk purchased Twitter in, in November and things started changing and Mastodon had a huge influx, but even now since January, things have changed dramatically. And it just seems like, I don't know, what are they going to look like in a year? You know, I'm interested to hear your perspective as someone who runs, you know, all this podcasting and the kinds of things that you do. I'm a nerd. So it's super interesting to me to think about this decentralized model of syndication, right? And, And every once in a while, I think I wonder how many people are subscribed to my blog via RSS. Like, I don't have a newsletter or anything like that. I have no idea. It could be two people. (laughs) The the two people who are on this... um, You're talking to them? Video call? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or, I mean, it could be more. And there's no real way to know because, you know, I've I've kind of looked into it a little bit. And there's there's services like uh, Feedly 
that I think they kick back like their subscriber counts if you like curl the right endpoint. But you know, that's just Feedly. There could be people could be subscribing in all kinds of different ways. There's Feedbin, there's you can do it just through your reader itself. So there's no real way to know. And therefore it's hard to I'm not in the business of making money off of my blog. So I don't really have to care about it that much. But for you, is that kind of a world interesting to you or does it seem even more difficult to be able to sort of make a living off of it because it would be so hard there's no centralized entity where you can grab all this information that you know allows you to monetize what you're doing does that actually just make it harder it makes it harder but i still like it more than the alternative because because we're not you know serving at the the behest of the king or whatever that saying is we have more agency over the way we do what we do. Of course, if we're talking about podcast distribution versus written, it's it's different, right? So like we look at the social networking as just promotional channels. Of course, it's always fun to interact with people who enjoy our content. So that's not really promotional. That's just like, I don't know what you call it, community. I like to just talk to people who are interested in similar stuff that I am. And that's going to be our listeners. That's going to be our guests. That's going to be Nick, um, even though he doesn't like talking to me that much, but <laughs> but TypeScript I do mostly because I razz him constantly. But uh, that to me just feels like you know conversational, the social side. But then you talk about distribution of like written words. So we have a newsletter. We got numbers around the newsletter. We have RSS. Like you, we do not have numbers around RSS. We took click tracking out of our newsletter because we just doesn't feel good. So we just took it out. Like we don't know what you click on in our newsletter and that makes us different to, to nerds like us who care about those kind of things. So really, we lean more into like impact and for lack of better word, influence and like engagement of our, the people who listen, then we do numbers. So like any company that wants to advertise with us and they're like, it has to be this numbers. It has to be reported in this way. It needs to be I a B standardized. It's like, sorry, our stats aren't we're not going to pay $50,000 a year to have our stats standardized, right? We just don't get that business. And we're just have to be okay with that, you know, because, well, we get other people. There's people who do get it, who do understand, who do like us, and they don't need the numbers like the ones that do. You know what I'm saying? So you just kind of miss out on that business. And that's okay because we're a small company, right? It's Adam, myself, a couple employees, contractors. We can float by on the people who get it and not have to go get those big contracts, those big advertisers. We've never done a Squarespace. We're not doing a Casper, right? We're not doing the big dogs. I know on the Verge cast, I think they have IBM and uh, Oracle and like Reuters. I don't know. They have huge advertisers that we're never going to get because those people are all based on numbers and clicks and all of the ad tech stuff. We just have to miss out on it and we're okay with that. I feel like you're also probably just not a very good example of it, just given the audience, right? Like your audience is probably naturally allergic to any kind of tracking whatsoever. And so, you know, it, like I could put analytics on my blog and it probably is not going to do all that much a, cause I don't get any visitors and B if I did, I wouldn't be able to track them cause they block <laughs> the, the trackers. And so I right. don't get much, but you do kind of like abstract out of that a little bit with you know, you're controlling the ads that go through that. You're not relying on your distribution channel, like Spotify to inject ads or something like that. And it's the same thing with like YouTube, right? I, I pay for premium, so I don't see ads, but then I constantly have to skip through the ads that they do personally in every video, oh, which yeah, is okay. Like sponsored but, stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, YouTubers, they got, they got a good, they got both the injectable ads, which are just like easy money at scale. Once you're at scale, not easy money for anybody else, but then they also can do the brand deals and those are those can be done really well. You know, a good ad I think is, can be entertainment. Look at the way dude perfect does there. I mean, they're, they're really good, but I don't know, Jim, does that answer your question? I mean, we, with podcasting, we have it a little bit better because at the end of the day, they download our MP3. And so we have at least that, you know, like where you have, okay, maybe you have site traffic to your blog post. And I know you're using Netlify because I think you talked about it, like their server side thing. And so I'm sure they're doing a decent job of getting rid of bots, but there's probably some bot traffic in there and like it's 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 fuzzy. We have, you know, plausible analytics on our website, but like Nick said, most of our people block it. So, you know, what do you do? We just say, well, bump it by probably 13, 15, 17% and you're probably about accurate. And, you know, that's good enough for 
the way that we do math around here. Spotify rehosts, so Spotify traffic doesn't show up in any of our MP3 traffic. So like there's a silo that we just opt into because they're so big and we want to be where the people are. We're like, well, we don't want to like sell people who are not on Spotify if that's where they listen to podcasts. So we'll just let them go ahead and have their own little silo of stats and try to pull them in and aggregate them for ourselves. But they've stopped us at the API layer from doing that. And so we're like, well, we'll just be like, well, add another 10% and you get Spotify. You know, it's not exactly accurate, but good enough. So roundabout answer, but that's kind of how I feel about it. I'd rather have the podcasting world than any other world where I'm basically just living off the land of a platform, you know? Because, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Facebook really pulled the bait and switch. I mean, and yet here we are on their content creators years ago, right? I mean, if you had 100 Facebook followers and you posted content to Facebook, it, at one point, it went to 100 people. And they said, you know, the news feed, double down, also they said double down on video. It was way early. Everyone did it, really expensive. And then they just didn't, it didn't work out and people lost a lot of money. But all these publications doubled down on Facebook, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And because if you could build a plat, if you could build the audience there, you could publish to your audience. And then they freaking crank that back and now you got to pay for the audience that you built. And that was the formula for everybody else. Like it was so good for Facebook. It was so bad for the rest of us that I just, I don't want to live in that world where somebody can just like, reject me access to the audience that I built. It's just wrong. So I'd much rather have the Mastodon. I would much rather have the Fediverse. I'd much rather have the podcasting world, even with all the problems. I mean, discovery, slowness, right? Like lack of features. There's tons of problems. Yeah. But it's just a better situation. I think I actually have a, a post draft about this idea of maybe not having an algorithmically you know, driven feed, maybe a feed that you have to curate and manage yourself is a good thing. And maybe the world would be a better place if everyone had to manage by hand their own feed of content. And you probably can guess at what I'm trying to get at with that. But the idea being it, you know, it takes work, but things that take work are usually, you're usually better off for it than um, something that takes no work. Well, your life requires curation, right? Like our lives is a series of decisions about what we want to do with them. And so like that's work, you know, your relationships are work, your health is work, your hobbies are work. You know, the only thing that's not work is TV, right? You just sit there and let it come to you and that's no way to live your life. But I, I'm 100% I'm with you. Like I've, for years, and Twitter was my favorite platform for many years and I freaking just curated my feed. So I, like if you're posting too often, sorry, I like you. But I can't do seven from you in one day because I have to have a mixture. You're, I'm just going to unfollow. And, you know, I do that. I put the work in. I follow people who are positive, people who post interesting stuff, some troll accounts that I like, that I enjoy. And life was good. And then everything changed. Everything changed. So, I, I mean, write that post. And that's really how Mastodon works. Yeah. I mean, it's always good to have those, you know, junk food accounts in there. Like you need a little junk food in your life, right? Well, sure. Just not the whole, your whole diet is composed of junk food. That's right. I really am rooting for Mastodon in this whole thing. I have problems with the platform, mostly around just clunky, slow. And of course, onboarding is awful, but it's mostly just like slow. But I really hope it's successful. I mean, it, it kind of already is to a certain extent, but we're still going to just post our stuff everywhere. I don't know. One of the things I love about uh, Mastodon is, and I feel like I was trying to express this a little bit in that same post, is this ability for you to, you know, have whatever third party client you want access. So there can be lots of people designing experiences that they think are interesting and good to them. And there's this diversity in what you can pick from to access this content. And this is specifically for Mastodon, right? There's tons of different Mastodon clients, but it's the same for podcasts. There's lots of different podcast clients and you can pick your favorite one. And, you know, there's different people creating different ones that, that center around different ideas of what it's like to listen to podcasts. And I think that's really interesting. And I think it would be really interesting if this idea of, you know, distributed syndicated content could enter the larger public consciousness and you could 
have all these different boutique clients for accessing the different kinds of information that you that you want to access. Like I, I love Mastodon and I stand it because I love uh, Ivory from Tapbots, right? I love Tapbots apps. And I feel like that drives my interest in using the platform because it's such a great client. And it would be cool to have clients, different clients for podcasts, different clients for blogs, different clients for video, different clients for whatever it is you want to, to consume online. Do you think that we'll get there that Mastodon could win out if Threads follows through and integrates with... Oh, and federates? Yeah. Good question. I know there's a lot of uh, Mastodon rage about it. Like, will, will you federate? Will you not? I like the fact that you can just make that choice, you know, mm-hmm. and people can federate or not. I don't know about threads. It's just like the verdict is out or the jury is out, whatever that saying is. I just feel like it's too early to know. For me, threads feels very much like, what if Instagram didn't have pictures? <laughs> it's like, well, the only thing good is the pictures. <laughs> man. Like, It's very fluffy and brandy and like, you know, I don't know, influencer-y. Yeah. Where it's like... That's why it's going to win out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might. Exactly. It, it might. And, but if I can access that, like I have a threads account and I have a Mastodon account and yeah, if they, same. if they integrate, I will probably just post from the Mastodon one, but I'll follow a bunch of people from threads. And I think that that would be fantastic because I, I'm tired of going to the blue sky, going to Twitter. I'm not going to call it the other name, going to threads, going, like going to all of these. X is going to give it to you, Nick. <laughs> I just think DMX is rolling in his grave right now because, like, all of his songs, all of his branding is just getting, like, reused by X.com. I hope that one dies. Blue Sky is the one that I pieced out on. There's just too many apps to launch, you know? Yeah. But I do like that feature where you can get your domain name. Exactly. That For that well, reason. Well, here's what's interesting about that, Jim. So you got on Blue Sky because you can get your domain name, but also it's your domain name. Nobody could have taken it from you, right? I know. So like, what was the hurry for? <laughs> <laughs> I know. There was no land grab there, right? Exactly. Just the novelty. The novelty of it. No, I get it. It's a cool feature. It's yeah. the cool feature. And that is something that's interesting that, that I've done for years. Like when I go to conferences and stuff, if I am given a blank name tag to write my name on, I just write my Twitter handle and put it on there. And like today, now what do you do? I still do it because at Nick Nisi is what I am everywhere. So it doesn't matter. Like you fill in what you want and I will probably be there with that name. No dashes. And, uh, Oh, ouch. <laughs> Sorry. I'll be there as Nick hyphen Nisi to, <laughs> to imitate you unverified account i'll pay the eight bucks a month i'll get ver- verified as at nick dash nisi <laughs> just to troll you even harder <laughs> this reminds me of a draft that i have which is literally the way i do drafts jim is i just write a title and i never write anything else because i like titles but i don't like writing have ai write it for you oh i'm kind of over that at the time. i'm in the trough of delusionment so <laughs> It's called something along the lines of RSS is the indie social web. And I know the RSS is missing some stuff, you know, and maybe that's that what's Matt and Reese's thing, which uh, has a small Microblog. indie. Yeah. Microblogging, which I think has RSS in there. There's stuff that's missing from RSS to make it feel like the more modern social networks. But for my money, which is not very much money because it's indie, you can just subscribe to people's blogs on RSS and then read them there. And then if we had a share mechanism, I guess we just, I, I use the social networks for this, but that was built in somehow. Share and discovery inside RSS, which is what Google Reader had. I would just be happy. I just I could just be done with everything else, right? Because your podcasts are in there. Your, you can get your memes in there. You can get your blog posts. Like it's everything that we want, isn't it? What's missing? Share and discovery. Google Reader. Why was Google Reader the thing? don't know. Okay. So I have, I I have a blog post on this. Okay. Is this a real one or a draft? (laughs) This is a draft. Uh, this is what I want to write. So this is how I think of it right now. I love Google reader. Speaking of things that, you know, quit before it was time. Uh, there's another one. They left us one more, but that was a bad quit. (laughs) Yeah, that was a bad everything at Google back in that era. I loved subscribing to blogs still do, but I had my wife, brothers and sisters who were subscribed to blogs. And my theory is that back when there was Blogspot and all these really easy ways for people to create blogs, there were more people creating more blogs about more interest about more things, and there was more sort of incentives around getting traffic and being able to create a blog about anything that you could maybe make some money off of. And 
you know, my wife, for example, she's subscribed to all these blogs that now have mostly fallen by the wayside. And sometimes I ask her about it. She's like, yeah, I just, I, the few people who are left who still have actual websites and aren't posting on Twitter or whatever, like I just go to their website. I just type in the domain and go to it myself. And she doesn't have a, a reader anymore because Google killed Google reader. And she was never interested enough to like figure out how to, to migrate from that. And so I think there were a lot of incentives around producing content for the open web under, you know, domains that you owned or maybe, you know, .blogspot.com. And so there were a lot more blogs and there were a lot more people writing for blogs and people reading them. And I think that kind of died away. And I feel like what we need is, that's the world that I miss nostalgically, where I would talk to my brothers and sisters and my wife about like random blogs that they followed. It could be a car blog, a mommy blog, all kinds of different things, right? And that's more of what I miss about Google Reader is that sort of more people were doing it. Maybe, and I think it's maybe because there was that in, there were those incentives that just don't exist today. Could we bring those back? Do you think that it was because it was like it effectively felt like it was provided by the platform? The platform being Google, like to your wife, you know, it's, it's just right there. You don't have to go search for this third party thing and install it. Is that what the appeal was of Google Reader? I think that was definitely part of it. The ease of it, like I already have a Google account. Gmail and stuff like, oh, look, there's this reader thing over here. Now we answer the question on Dino KV. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's come full circle. <laughs> I already have this Dino runtime. <laughs> 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 okay. So what we need is a TypeScript runtime for RSS readers. <laughs> or am I get am I missing the point? Yeah, please don't put TypeScript and RSS in the same sentence. Nick wants to put it in every sentence, so don't tempt him with such challenges. <laughs> okay, well, I think we have more to say, but no more time to say it, unless we want to make this a marathon episode or maybe a two-part. Jim, we'll have to have you back. We have picked out a couple other blogs, and I, some of your drafts will become real. You know, they'll turn into real boys and girls over the next X days, and we'll have you back on the show to talk some more. I really enjoyed this conversation, like I said, love re reading what you write. I read it right there in my RSS reader. And then I go out to all the social networks and talk about it. But if you're a developer, maybe you're a TypeScript dev and you want a new project, some sort of Google reader thing that appeals to the masses. In TypeScript. In TypeScript, uh, right there on the global object would be the would be a hit, I think. Get people doing RSS again. It's a pipe dream, but it's my pipe dream. Anything else, guys? Anything else left unsaid before we call this a show? I think we've found a good time to quit. Or stop. We'll finish. I'm sorry. Be done with. We like to give Nick the last word. No, we don't. We <laughs> like to act like we're going to give him the last word and then not let him talk again because we know what that last word will be. So for Nick Neesey. Elixir. Hey. <laughs> our new friend, Jim Nielsen. Jim hyphen Nielsen. Dot com. I am Jared. This is JS Party, and we'll talk to you again on the next one. We ran out of time, but we didn't run out of stuff to talk about. Jim stuck around for another 15 minutes after the show so we could review some of his draft blog posts, learn why he hates share images. I hate those things and pass each other a few fun quotes about writing. So, our Changelog++ members get to hear that as a bonus right after this outro. Enjoy, y'all. If you aren't a Changelog++ member, we'd love for you to join. It is the highest impact way you can support our work with your hard-earned cash. As a thanks for your support, we hook you up with an ad-free feed and extended episodes like this one right here. Learn more about it at changelog.com slash plus plus. There's a link in your show notes and chapter data. Thanks again to our partners, fasty.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. And to Breakmaster Cylinder for being our beat freak in residence. Next up on the pod, Nick and Josh Goldberg celebrate 10 years of Nick using TypeScript. I'm also there, but mostly just to troll them all along the way. That is a fun one, so stay tuned right here. We'll have it ready for you next week.